Um, so we, of course, want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. You can see their logos on the screen. We are so extremely grateful to have each and every one of you um, in our corner, but also in every single corner of the nonprofit sector. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you do to lift up millions billions of missions and causes around our globe. And Julia, you're right there lifting them up too. Uh, Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Uh, so glad to join you each and every morning. I'm Jarrett Ransom, the Nonprofit Nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And those glasses, as you just saw in my logo, were also just on Jeffrey's face. So thank you for that, Jeffrey. We are going to nerd out with you. You're one of my favorite nerd peers, um, an innovative disruptor, uh, like just totally my kin. I love it. So Jeffrey Wilcox joins us. He is the president and chief advancement officer with Third Sector Company. And you are joining, uh, joining us today as a thought leader to talk to us specifically about a topic, um, board governance. But first, let me welcome you, Jeffrey, and thanking you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. I can't think of a better place to be and people I love talking nonprofit stuff with. So thanks for hanging out with me this morning. Absolutely. You know, we get this question a lot and it starts like this, a board chair, maybe a CEO, maybe an, an, a board chair coming up says, oh my God, we need help on board governance. And a lot of times I'll say, okay, what's your idea of board governance? And they'll be like, well, we don't really know. So that's why we need help because we don't really know. And so I'm fascinated by this. And it's, it's almost like peer pressure, Jeffrey, the sense of like board governance, board governance, yeah. but what is it? So let's back up and start there. Well, Julia, you've hit on a, a million dollar question. We could play the family feud on this one with, you know, a, a, ask the studio audience how they define governance. We've got a game show. I, I spent, you know, 20 years of my career with United Ways in great cities in this country, including Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And as a funder of not-for-profits, I did have a rather unique view of relationships with boards and the, the role that, that boards play in just a variety of organizations. And you are so right. Um, we also don't have a lot of help right now, because even if you pick up various dictionaries and you pick up the word governance, there are so many different answers for this. And so I, I like to take a very uncomplicated role about this. Um, governance really is an organization exercising stewardship with the community it serves. It is exercising stewardship. And, and that word has to do with, that means that we have an accountability to the community that we serve in making sure that our organization is creating the impact that we all want to see. It is, it is different than a corporate board because you're overseeing here a cause versus overseeing a corporation. We were all causes before we were corporations. And so it took a board of, it, it took a first board to become so great at being a cause. Guess what? They had to incorporate. Pretty interesting, but, but, but the answer to the question is, it really is about stewardship and action based in having a check and balance, about doing diligence, and it's about being accountable to a community. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, when you say cause, I just want you to know, and I, and I want to like just own up to this. Uh, well, one, I could listen to you talk and just nerd out all, all year long, 24-7, right? Um, because it just, it just speaks to me. Like I said, we are kin. We are just, you know, related. Um, I am currently in your board chair academy, and that is something that I decided to take after going through your interim executive academy. I said, I want to know more about how these um, two pivotal, you know, pieces play a role in one another. And it was during your board chairs Academy, Jeffrey, that I learned or really heard it expressed this way that you just said of, you know, we are governing a cause. And I have since then changed my vernacular, right? It's like, oh, we're governing the nonprofit. We're governing the organization. We're governing. It's like, we're governing a cause. And that to me just 
turned me on my head, spun me, you know, upside down. And I was like, of course, that's what we're doing. That makes so much more sense. And I just want, I want to witness to you and for all of those, you know, watching and listening, that was a big aha moment for me. Well, you know, for, for me, just having a conversation with the board about what is intrinsically different between a group of people who see themselves as governing, however they define that word, governing an institution versus governing a community movement, a community cause. Yeah. So, you know, this makes me ask you this question about board governance systems, because it seems to me that we have a lot of different things coming at us now. We have advisory boards, we have the board of directors, we have young you know, professional boards, we have teen boards, we have all these different things. And it seems, is though we're understanding that the, that the successful organizations have successful boards, no matter the cause. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be frank with you, sometimes I look at, you know, across this landscape, million point eight nonprofits, and it's easy to become a snob. You can say, wow, that's not really a worthy cause, but yet they get it right. They make more money than anybody else. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, how we look at some of these systems um, and if you're seeing that. Well, of course I'm seeing it, but I, I think the difference between you, you used, I think the word, you know, really successful boards or excellent boards. Um, I, I think where we as a nonprofit sector have kind of tripped on our own feet, um, Julia, is are we preoccupied <laughs> with the process of governance or should we be pre preoccupied on the outcome of governance? And, and you pick up a lot of books and you pick up a lot of magazine articles and, and professional journals that will tell you the how-tos of governance as though it's like making a meatloaf. You know, people live in a neighborhood and everybody can like is off on the bake-off. Yeah. But, but we get preoccupied in how we do it. And the funny part about it is, to your point, even organizations that, that you may even kind of like question, they're real clear on their outcomes. Mm -hmm. And the process is merely the details. And so are you an organization that is preoccupied with the weeds or the trees, or are you an organization who's preoccupied by the forest? Mm -hmm. And on the subject of governance, you can pick up a lot of books that just talk about all the trees. And, and, and for me, what I teach is whether you have one staff or no staff, or you have 500 staff, whether you have a board of eight or you have a board of 800, when you concentrate on a group of people who are trying to achieve an outcome together, they will develop the system that's appropriate for their culture, for their community and their people to get that outcome achieved. And it's not for me to write a book and tell them how to do it. It is for me to tell them what the end of the journey should be. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, I, I believe that, that governance has to have six outcomes whether you're a small organization or you're a large one. One of those outcomes has to be that you are evolving with your community and you're making impact. That mm -hmm. is an outcome. Okay. How you choose to evolve your organization, the voices that you hear, the inclusiveness that is involved in that evolution process is yours. Mm -hmm. But however you do it, an outcome of governance is you evolve your organization with the community that you serve. That is big, especially in, yeah. okay. it's making me think about, and, and I use pandemics plural because as, as Julie was saying earlier uh, with you, Jeffrey, you know, 2020 was a year of so much unrest, right? The, the global virus, um, the uh, social injustice, the um, political divide, the, the economic crash, there's a lot going on there. So the evolution of how we serve our community was that was big, what you just said. And I just want to, you know, make note of that because that really should take a, take a huge um, place in, <clears throat> excuse me, how you govern your cause um, is how it also evolves with the community needs. Absolutely. And what we've learned over the past year is the, out again, the outcome, I think remains the same, both pre pre pandemic and post, we have to evolve our organizations with our communities and our communities have gone through incredible change. Mm -hmm. the, you know, Julia put up on the screen the whole thing about governance systems. A governance system is nothing more 
than the voices and people who work together to create the outcome that your cause deserves. That's it. It is not a, a, a series of bodies that appear on a sheet of paper. Yeah. These, these are voices. And are the voices such that we are providing due diligence in having the kind of impact that our cause should have on the community? So systems will change. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you one other, another example. An, an outcome of governance is, is that you're preparing the next generation to take over from you. You have, you have an obligation to make sure that the community has a next generation of people to follow in your footsteps. They're not going to magically appear. That's an outcome of governance. So, you know, when I think of, when I hear from folks that are talking about governance and they talk about governance issues, it seems, it seems to me a lot of this is like, well, you know, our bylaws need to be updated. Our, you know, in, our board engagement needs to be, you know, we need to put thumbtacks on the wall that say, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And maybe what I'm hearing you say is we need to step back and look at that future piece. And, and you know, like you said, weeds versus the trees um, and even the, the distant lake in the future view. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because I don't know many boards that are looking down the road as much as work, worried about fundraising, of course, wolves at the door. And then that those those human issues that we have to deal with with our other board members and it's a lot of its accountability it's total accountability and and people want to get behind accountable organizations yeah but but here's what i have seen has happened julia is is that most of our organizations started out to change the world and they had a fire in in their in their in their soul and over a series of years, we, we moved from outwardly focused to inwardly gazed. So what happened is we went into the organization and decided to start dissecting it. Well, I have to tell you, in the early days, there wasn't an organization to dissect. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a group of people who were constantly building for the community. And until we get back to this zeal of building for the community, and that our boardrooms are where generations of people learn to be community leaders, where innovation comes from hearing all voices, and that, that our nonprofits actually have a role in changing systemic racism that exists in our community, do we begin, begin to say, do we really need to spend 45 minutes on this committee report? Right. Wow. Yeah. You know, I was just listening to a podcast the other day and Jeffrey, you know me so well. So I, I think you'll appreciate this humor. Uh, it was with Oprah Winfrey and they were saying how when there's a sound bite that comes out of a conversation, Oprah will say tweet, tweet, <laughs> because that means like it is such a good sound bite that that's going to be tweeted and like just going viral. So much of what you just said in my head, right? I'm going like tweet, tweet, because all of that is a great sound bite. Um, and, and you know this, and, and that's why you, you always say like, man, you make a, you know, a grown man blush is I could listen to you and how eloquent you put board governance, which some people would like snooze fest, right? On this platform of it's understandable, it, the accountability is a big piece. Like it makes me want to do more for my community and for the organization in which I'm serving. So, um, Again, in my head, I'm, I'm using the Oprah like tweet, tweet, because that soundbite is just brilliant. And, um, and I know that, that you speak volumes behind all of those sound bites. So uh, thank you thank for you. that. You know, well, it, go, go ahead. ahead. You know, it's interesting. Um, it seems to me, Jeffrey, that a lot of us worry about those inner workings and we're not looking at, at the future. And in, in the sense of, of where are we of value to our community? And I'm wondering how, when we've become so data structured and we, as board members, board leaders, CEOs, we look at this data and we're like, oh my God, we can't afford to, to serve our community or make payroll or whatever all those things are. It's really hard. It's really hard to 
get rid of that stress and project out into the future, right? I mean, I'm wondering how you do that because it's almost like saying, oh, it'll be okay. Let's think about the future. Well, yeah. And, you know, how you do it is, is dependent upon each organization. And where an organization is at in its life cycle also plays into this as well. There's just lots of variables. But I will tell you, Julia, I do think there are a couple of, uh, if we were going to a, a, a physician, there's some vital signs here that I think we could look at. One of the vital signs is how healthy is the relationship between the board and an executive director? Mm-hmm. Because a board that does not trust its management decides to go into the management business. And what happens is what you have done is you've created a management committee and the board and the organization no longer has a board right. um, okay. because you, you, you've you decided to become a management committee. Then why did you hire staff in the first place? Right. You, you hired staff because you had become such a force for the community that you needed an infrastructure. Mm-hmm. When you started focusing on the infrastructure, you lost the velocity that you had created in the community. And now your attention turned towards the management as opposed to the community. Mm -hmm. If management isn't helping you, change management, but don't change your board. Your board is the link between a community's promise for what it wants to be and a group of citizens who are working together to make it what it can be. And when you stop being that link of what you want for your community and what you can deliver for the, your community, you stopped being a board. And that's for, you were saying, Jeffrey, that's for any organization, any size organization, anywhere in the life cycle. It's just how you address the process, the systems within the maturity level, maybe of your organization that could be different. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. And there's a lot behind that, Jared. That, that, that's a statement that needs a lot of unpacking. But, but you have to also understand boards represent the power structure of an organization. Mm-hmm. Boards represent how you define privilege. Mm-hmm. If, if you, uh, I, I will tell you, if a number of boards, when they formed their organizations, had some of the, the requirements uh, then that they have now, you probably wouldn't have an organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Julia shared a great story. Um, it was about like an organization that had not changed its bylaws in probably over a hundred years or something. And um, and so some of some of those stories of evolving, <laughs> you know, saying this this might have been how you started, but that's not how we're going to continue. And and you're right, um, that does happen, Jeffrey. So Jeffrey, I've got to ask you this because it seems to me that it's such a big topic. How do we know when we're getting it right? You know, it seems to me a lot of boards get freaked out about governance when there may be other problems at hand. But because as we started this conversation, maybe they don't understand really how they should be performing, what the vernacular really is and what it means. But going in the other direction, how do we know? I mean, is this only something that comes up when we have problems? Good question, Julia, because I, I, I do think this, this complicated question actually has a fairly simple answer. Okay. The first simple answer is, you know, knowing when board governance is in place. Has your board spent time answering the question, what would we consider the optimal board for our cause? Have mm-hmm. we had a conversation about what do we as a group of people agree constitutes the optimal board for this cause. And it's not something that, that we hired a whole bunch of other people to come in and tell us what we should be. And, 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 and people have to take ownership in, is this the optimal board? And the optimal board in 2010 will probably be different than the optimal board in 2020. I often like to have board retreats where the whole conversation is about, please tell me about what it, what it would mean to have an optimal board for this organization. And then how do you know it's in place? Because you make a commitment to do an annual assessment. If you have agreed, these are the benchmarks of an optimal board that we've agreed to. And we have a governance committee or a board development committee that puts a strategy in place to oversee that these, what constitutes an optimal board in our shared opinion. Then we take an annual assessment to see how we're doing. That's when you know what's in place. And, and the one thing that we all have to remember is I often think that we refer to boards as though they're a person. 
and 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 that and that you know how do I how do I make my board better? That's like saying how do I make my child better, my parent better, my mother you know behave differently. <laughs> um, boards are not a being. Boards only change and grow because board members have been allowed to grow and change. Mm -hmm. A board is nothing more than the summation of the people around the table. So if you want to develop your board, you have to realize it happens one board member at a time. Wow. You know, that's pretty profound because I think there's a struggle that we have in modern board management, if you will. And I would say you're outside of that um, helping us to navigate a different way, but that it's most folks feel like, you know, our board should be performing and doing the exact same thing every meeting, every time, every year, no matter who the person is, as long as we're kind of ticking off those DEI boxes and we're meeting our, our financial goals. Well, and your point is well taken because when you have a conversation about what constitutes the optimal board, you then have to have a conversation what constitutes the optimal board meeting. Right. And you right. know what? Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I look at most board agenda, um, people are not having an optimal board meeting because it was never designed to be optimal. Right. Mm -hmm. It was not designed for community leaders to get engaged in, in provocative conversation about the issues that are confronting our, our fellow our fellow neighbors and, and and the working people in our community and 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 are we bringing people in to inform us uh, about how they're seeing the world um, if you don't have a board meeting that looks like a community at work you're not going to be an organization at work in the community right right that's power that's a powerful statement and that's so true you know it, it makes me think when I hear you speak like this, that one of the big profiles should be, or words that we're using around our board members should be like champion and ambassador and people that are going to be the voice, if you will, of the cause and going forward and rallying support versus that um, C-suite management approach. And, and is that know, fair? That's more than fair because I think... Um, the, the, the folks who are probably on your founding board described themselves as activists or advocates. They mm -hmm. didn't even, they didn't even talk about um, such um, nice things as ambassador or, or, or they, they were activists. Yeah. When, when most of the nonprofits in this country were going to fight homelessness, we're going to make sure that children were not abused, that women had the right to vote that all voices met, they didn't do that because they were ambassadors. Right. They did it because they were going to be advocates and they were going to have activism. And until our boards go back to what got us into business, I am convinced that's what's gonna keep us in business. And, and Julia, we've got, a, we've got a generation of people that are not going to support you because of what you do. They're going to support you because of what you stand for. And if they only see the staff standing up and standing for something, that delivers a huge message. They want people saying, this is wrong. This is right. And I'm going to give to that. And That's board, a great point. Go ahead. And, and what I'm hearing too, Jeffrey, is we also have a big you know, generation, well, and it's, and it spans generations, right? I think so many of us are really hungry, um, involved, right? We're hungry for that belonging. We're hungry for, um, that sense of what can I do to help, right? Where, where can my voice be heard? Where can my action be seen? So we really are filled with, you know, so many activists and advocates, um, for multiple causes. And I think, you know, so much goes beyond um, what does the board say? What does the staff say? What is that statement that's being made from the organization? Where can I play a role? Where do I fit in this cause and in the community? And so many of our supporters and just, you know, loyal loyal investors, if I, if I may be so bold to take a, a donor right into truly an investor of, of change. Um, I think we're looking for that. I think overall, you know, our, our population at large is really looking for, for that. We're looking to feed that, 
that craving of, of hunger and thirst of how can we play more of an activist role? How can we play more of an advocate role for this cause that we believe so heartfelt in? Absolutely. And, and the word that comes to my mind is actually contributor. How can I contribute um, to with whatever means I've got? How can I contribute to make sure that there is a four-year-old in our community that is not going to go to bed hungry, is not going to go to bed feeling unsafe, is going to feel that they are in a caring and loving home and they're ready and prepared to go to school. I want to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. What we as nonprofits have to figure out is how they can do that. And wow. if, it's, if, if it's to sit in the boardroom and tell the staff how to act, I got to tell you, that is not how the original board made it possible for children's advocacy organizations to get off the ground. And, and there are some fabulous children's organizations in the state of Arizona with the Arizona Children's Campaign that was started many years ago. And, and that's a key word that when you work and are part of an organization that is a, an advocating organization, you stop talking about a fundraising plan. You talk about a campaign plan. What is our campaign? It's a campaign for children. It's a campaign to end homelessness. And you know what? Every time we come into this boardroom, we've got to see, are we campaigning as we should? Wow. That creates what's called movements. Right. And that's the difference between governing a corporation and governing a cause. Causes thrive because they are moving. They are moving people and communities to higher ground in a quality of life that all of us want to share and we call Oh. Mm -hmm. Tweet, tweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm profoundly um, processing. Yes. Because, I mean, we've done a year of this, of this show, uh, five days a week. We've had over 250 different guests. And this is a, your voice is one that's pretty unique. I think that one thing is you're able to articulate things that maybe a lot of us think about or we, we can't, can't figure out how to verbalize it. And you do that brilliantly. But, but this is a really interesting conversation that you've brought forward with us today because it really is a profound change in how we are talking about board management. Um, and again, I just use that word, you know, management versus cause management versus, you know, strategic thinking. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing um, that you can kind of bring to light for all of us. And this is a discussion that with all of this change that we've had globally, as Jared has said, you know, multiple pandemics, um, this is the time to really evaluate where we are and what we're doing. And, and if we need to make change, um, a lot of times out of stress, you can, it's easier to make change, I believe. You know, um, Jeffrey Wilcox, amazing, amazing um, thought leader and who's joined us. Here's Jeffrey's information. Jeffrey does training with his team throughout the country. Um, and it's a fascinating, fascinating group to see what their thoughts are. You have so many different people on your team that are well-versed in the nonprofit sector. Of course, your um, legacy to our sector is profound, but not only you, Jeffrey, as, as you know, your team sharing that. Um, you've got your Interim Executive Academy, which I know Jarrett Ransom has gone through. It's been really impressive to see her um, trajectory and her career. This Board Chairs Academy, now that's relatively new, right? No, that's actually 14 years old. Oh. Next week, we're going to graduate our 23rd class over 400 nonprofits. Wonderful. And I'm in that now. And like I said, I wanted to know more from the interim executive position and how the Board Chairs Academy really works. Um, I am blown away every session. Of course, I just learn more and more and more that I want to continue to sink my teeth deeper into. So I highly recommend both of these academies. Awesome. It's really cool. Third sector company. Amazing. I've been a great supporter, a great educator to us all. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom. And wow, those glasses really do work, right, Jeffrey? I love being a nerd. I wouldn't want to be anything else. 
<laughs> Words <laughs> rock. We did right. so much to today's conversation. Clearly a wonderful thought leader. Um, love so much about, about what you offer. And um, also many of these companies you see in front of you offer, you know, tremendous support and contributions to our sector at large. So thanks to our presenting sponsors. Absolutely. Wow. Jeffrey, you are a treasure. We are thrilled that you would be our thought leader. Um, the nonprofit sector is um, always an exciting place to be, but when you're with us, you really unlock a lot of uh, possibilities. And I love what you have to say. You always energize me. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, it's Jeffrey. Been, it's been thank you. Hey, as we end every day, we want to remind everyone, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here 